Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the first in a three part series on seed keeping um, with True Love Seeds. We're really excited to be here with Owen Taylor and Julia Aguilar. And we are so grateful for you guys uh, leading today's workshop. Um, this first part is about garden planning for seed saving and seed keeping. So what are the things you have, you know, want to keep in mind if you want to save your seeds later? My name is Mara Gittleman. I am the workshops and education coordinator for NYC Parks Green Thumb. We are the part of the New York City Parks Department that works with community gardens across the city. And today um, we are recording this workshop and we're going to make it available on our website and YouTube channel. And you can decide whether or not your camera is on using the little camcorder icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, but we'll have the recording focused on just the speakers. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. I'm going to be collecting them and holding on to them until it's time for Q&A. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. So without further ado, I pass the mic to Owen and Julia. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. It's nice to see some familiar names and some new names. Um, we are Julia and Owen <laughs> from True Love Seeds. Do you want to go first? for being here. Um, my name is Julia Aguilar. I am a farmer, staff member, um, office person um, at True Love Seeds. And if you are not familiar with us, we're a small farm and seed company based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We farm just outside of Philly. Um, and we grow seed for sale. We focus on culturally important vegetable, flower, and herb seeds. Um, and we partner with, at this point, of about 50 other farms uh, to offer a wide variety of these culturally important plants for seed in our online catalog. Um, and yeah, we're a profit sharing seed company. So all of the farms that we partner with who are mostly small farms, um, urban farms, LGBTQ farmers, farmers of color, um, they all get 50% of all of the sales that we make of their seeds that we offer. Um, so yeah, yep. <laughs> That's great. Um... And I'm Owen, I'm one of the co-founders of True Love Seeds, and I'm especially excited to be here. I love doing, you know, partnerships with Green Thumbs since I worked for seven years in New York City with community gardeners. Um, it's just so great to have the opportunity to continue to stay connected and kind of share what I've been learning in my journey with seed keeping um, and my longer journey with food justice uh, with this community. So thank you so much to Green Thumb, to Mara for continually partnering with, with me and with us. Um, so yeah, today we're going to get into, you know, this is perfect because we never get to do workshops this time of year on seed saving. It's usually right when it's harvest time and we're doing the hands-on seed cleaning, which is really one of the most fun and important parts of seed saving or seed keeping. Uh, but this time of year, we get to think ahead and figure out how can we plan our gardens to be more successful in our seed saving efforts and seed keeping efforts. So it's exciting to have the space for this. Uh, we're going to talk about first just why, why should we save seeds for those of you who are, haven't gotten into it yet. Um, and we're going to have a heavy emphasis on culturally important seeds since that's really our focus. So we'll talk a bit about that and, and as well as some other reasons to save your own seeds beyond cultural preservation. Uh, we also will talk about crop planning um, and get into a little botany just so we can understand what exactly is happening in the sexual reproductive life of our plants, which is necessary for most of them to have viable seed so that we can strategize around you know, how many of which plants we grow in which part of our garden and when we harvest them, things like that. So we'll dip a little bit at the end into when to harvest. Um, and but that'll lead into our final workshop where we'll really focus on the, the demo 
kind of when to harvest, how to harvest, etc. on our third workshop that will follow um, after the next one. So that's a little heads up on the agenda for this hour. Uh, we wanted to ask you a question. Maybe you could pose it since I just jabbered on. <laughs> Jabbering, welcome. <laughs> yeah, we would love to know um, from you all out there, what crop are you most excited to uh, try saving seeds from this year? So if you have a crop in mind already um, at your garden that you hope to watch throughout the season and gain joyous, viable seeds from at the perfect mature time, please, enter that crop into the chat and maybe we can um, touch on like those varieties of plants and specifically what you should be watching for um, this season so we can give some tips. Great, I already see heirloom tomatoes coming in. Please keep them coming. Yes, oh, great, yay. Oh, everybody. Here they come. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great, we'll keep an eye on it. Yes. While we go. Cool. Nice. <gasps> Rue. It's hard not to just actually respond to all of things. I know, it's so great. Amazing. We'll, we'll respond as we go along. Yeah. So let's start with why. Why save seeds? And, you know, the centerpiece of what we do at True Love, as Julia mentioned, is focusing on cultural preservation through seed keeping. And I guess I'll say before we jump into, you know, too deeply, we talk about seed keeping. You can see it's my Instagram handle for True Love Seeds. And seed keeping is really a concept that I learned about through uh, my friend, brother Blaine Snipstall, who had been at the White Earth Land Recovery Project's uh, Indigenous Farming Conference many years ago and learned from many of the elders and, and young people there, most of whom you know, were from that region, Anishinaabe, et cetera, um, that seed keeping was a term and seed keeper was a term they used to describe themselves as people not just saving genetic material, you know, saving anonymous seeds, but saving seeds that are deeply connected to their cultural legacy, to their rituals, to their recipes, to their, you know, language. And so for us, seed keeping has become exactly that. You know, we save seeds that are deeply connected to us, um, our, our own ancestry, our region, you know, uh, seeds that tell, help to tell our story and tell the story of the people that came before us. And so that when we say seed keeping, we are talking about seed saving, uh, but plus, you know, honoring the story uh, and names of the seeds and the, pe the keepers that came before us. So I just wanted to say that about seed keeping. Um, and maybe I'll pass it to you because we both will share a little bit about our own cultural seeds as we help to get people excited about seed keeping. Nice. Yeah, seed, seed keeping as cultural scholarship, seed, seed scholar, cultural scholars. That's how I feel when we do stuff. So yeah, very exciting. Um, yeah, I would just thought I'd give a little intro about how I came to seed saving and how I came to true love. Um, my professional um, background is more, more so in perennial horticulture um, Mid-Atlantic native plants and medicinal herbalism and, and um, production farming for medicinal herbalism. Um, so seed saving or farming for seeds, like that a seed could be a crop, um, was a totally foreign idea to me. Um, you know, I grew up knowing that seeds come in a packet and that was pretty much, I just, that's where I thought they started was in the packet. <laughs> Uh, it never occurred to me that uh, this is such a, a pivotal, long-standing um, human tradition in relationship with plants. Um, so as Owen mentioned, um, at True Love, we do focus on culturally important plant varieties. So each of us on staff um, stewards, you know, we choose an ancestral crop or sometimes multiple. Um, that we steward uh, to, to save seeds from and potentially offer in the catalog um, if we want to and we're able to get that seed. And one seed that I'm super, super excited about um, growing for this year is this Ecuadorian 
pinstripe peanut that we're trying. Um, we also grew it last year and had sort of a, oh, I don't know word, a little bit of a bedraggled seed harvest from it, um, which is something I'm, I find fascinating is that year by year, you just learn so much about the plant um, from each seed harvest and learning mistakes or what to plan for next year. Um, so we're planting um, a lot, I feel, this year uh, in hopes of getting a, a larger seed crop than last year. Um, and we noticed that it might not have been a fully mature seed. So I feel like we will probably be planning to harvest it even a little later um, than we did last year. And one reason I personally am just super excited about this peanut um, and just sort of developing my relationship with this plant is because um, I'm a first generation Ecuadorian, I'm from Philly, um, and I never knew that um, peanuts are native to the Andes. Um, they're an Andean crop that was domesticated there by indigenous peoples to the Andes thousands of years ago. Um, and I've always really loved peanuts and eating peanut things. Um, there was uh, this recipe I grew up eating that um, I loved so much that I just assumed it was a family recipe, which was this uh, stewed chicken with peanut sauce and rice um, that I would just tell everyone was my mom's recipe. Uh, and later in my life, I found out it was like a, a West African recipe that she had like, you know, learned out of a magazine, but I thought that it was our, our cultural, just like this, this like family recipe. Uh, that was connected to our culture. Um, and I was kind of salty about it, to be honest. And then when I started learning more about plants and seeds, I realized that peanuts are actually like native to the place where my family is from in the Andes. And it kind of was this very full circle experience for um, this food and connecting the many multiple stories culturally that are attached to peanuts in the US, including the West African roots and stories um, about peanuts. So I have found uh, more and more out as I have grown closer to this crop um, of peanuts. And I'm just really excited to, to grow it better this year and potentially, um, potentially offer it in the catalog. It's really exciting for me. Yeah, thank you. Well, part of our problem with the peanuts last year was the rodents. Mm -hmm. We had to lift them early because the voles were eating them all. Um, so we're hoping with our new farm this year and with a lot more plants, there'll be enough for us and the other creatures and maybe there'll be fewer creatures this year, hopefully, who knows. Um, but definitely something to plan for when you're planting for seed. Right. Think <laughs> so about, are you providing cover for rodents near your important legume, underground legume crop, yeah. <laughs> which we were. So things to think about. Um, we'll plant them wide out in the open this time so it's the, the rodents are less comfortable, you know, traveling to eat them. Um, yeah. One of my ancestral, I'm, I'm mostly Irish and Southern Italian. And I remember the first aha moment when I was working for for my mentor, Dr. William Boyce Weaver, with his seed collection, was when I was planting the lumper potato and learned the history of that potato and its presence during the Great Hunger in Ireland, um, and learned more about my own family in Ireland during that time. And it just became a very powerful touchstone for me. I like to think of seeds as touchstones of certain stories and histories. Um, but what I really want to talk about is a Southern Italian crop um, it's a burlato bean. Actually, most of the Southern Italian crops we grow, and I, we do grow a lot of them, originate in other continents as a species, uh, like the tomato, the pepper, the, the burlato bean, all of them are from the Americas. We grow a black eyed pea and a, and a cacuza gourd, those are from Africa. So when you get into seed stories, you can dig deeper too and find the long story. Um, but for me, I found the burlato bean because I, was developing a relationship, a friendship with a friend from the Mohegan Reservation. And the Mohegan tribe in Connecticut is, you know, the tribe closest to where I grew up um, in Northeastern Connecticut. And so my friend Rachel Sayet sent me a recipe of her great uncle's um, 
succotash uh, recipe that he'd make out of lima beans. Or, or she was inspired because I, I, she saw my calendar. There was a lima bean on it. We make a calendar every year with seed stories. And I was talking about Wampanoag recipes for succotash and said, we make it too. Here's my great uncle's recipe. And I have the, the burlato bean in there. And I looked into the burlato bean um, and I learned it's Southern Italian. And I was like, oh, the Southern Italian bean is in this Mohegan recipe. Let me, let me plant this because it intersects with two of my stories, my Southern Italian story and my Connecticut you know, story. Um, and you know, I eventually led workshops for the Mohegan reservation um, at, you know, at their center. And when they saw the burlata bean on the screen, they were like, that's our bean. And um, I learned from my friend's mother that it's because they would buy those beans from the Southern Italian immigrants in Connecticut um, who were planting them. And so it kind of tied together this weaving of history, this complicated history um, in a way that helps me understand myself better and feel pretty connected to this bean and to like the various communities my ancestors were a part of or connected to for better or worse. Um, and so these are some of the ways that we connect to the seeds in our garden. And we just wanted to spend some serious time telling our seed stories to, you know, maybe pose you another question for the, for the chat saying, you know, if there was a seed that tells your story that reminds you of home or your ancestors' homelands, what might that be, right? I'd love to see if, if that changes any of your answers or if you might be interested in learning to grow and save seeds from any of those crops. Um, and for some of us, it's very hard to find that because of assimilation um, by choice or by force um, in this continent. Um, so it can be a complicated journey to find our ancestral seeds. And for some people, it's a very easy answer. Uh, so I want to acknowledge that. Um, but let's talk about other reasons to save seed. One thing that people talk about a lot is it saves you money. Um, so, you know, when you think about the cost of a seed packet or the cost of plants at the nursery, uh, and then you think about going out into your garden and gathering seeds that your plant is offering up for free, uh, you can see why people say it saves you money. I mean, certainly most of what we grow, we hardly buy any seeds at all for our half acre farm because we're a seed production farm. But that's something that I like to encourage gardeners to do, especially in this time of seed shortages. You know, with the pandemic, so many seed companies are running out of our favorite varieties, are shutting down for weeks at a time to catch up with orders. And so we can see now more than ever the importance of saving the seeds of the crops that are most important to you, just in case they're not available elsewhere for, for, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. There's also this idea of abundance. We were talking about this yesterday. It, it just kind of seed keeping really helps us understand the abundance of the plant world. Um, I don't know if you can think of any good examples or. Yeah, I think just what you are already talking about when you know you purchase seeds in a packet from somewhere. Um, you know, they cost money for a reason, but maybe there's only 30 seeds in there or 10 seeds in there or 50 seeds in there. Um, whereas you could plant five of those plants, potentially, depending what the variety is. And in one season, you will have hundreds of seeds, hundreds, mm -hmm. no exaggeration. A which, thousand, yeah, depending on the species. Which is like still shocking to me um, and so impressive and gorgeous, but it really, it really shows you once you are harvesting that seed, um, similar to growing one's own food or medicine and, and harvesting, harvesting that for the first time. Um, you know, that's not something I grew up doing. This is, these are things I'm still learning. So every year I, I am shocked by how much food there really is, how much medicine there really is, how much seeds literally come off of these off of these plants so that it becomes clear so quick, quick quickly that there there is there couldn't be a shortage the shortage is man-made and seed companies I've heard you say this before seed companies are a very new concept of people selling seed back to you um, these are seed saving is is something all of us did in all of our cultures, mm -hmm. literally, you know, anywhere in the world, 
And it's only been very recently that there's been a shift to where we don't all have the access to um, these traditions, which are, um, you know, like the definitive traditions of a healthy society. Mm -hmm. The healthier we are, the more we retain these traditions, the more we pass down um, growing knowledge, um, preservation knowledge of, of food and plants, seed saving knowledge. Um, and just the clearer it becomes that when you grow it yourself or in tandem with community, there's enough for everyone. Um, and that's a sign of a healthy society, right? So it's a sign of a healthy community that, that there is abundance, there's enough to share. And seed saving is, is such an incredible sort of very tangible, very immediate um, example of that from the plants, I feel. Yeah, and when we find that we have more than we need, I mean, we're a seed company, so we're luckily able to send seeds out to you know countless people. Uh, but we also do seed swaps here in Philadelphia, and that's a great way to kind of share that abundance if we all become seed savers, uh, seed keepers. We, we, we try to provide forums here or spaces for the seed keepers of our area to swap with each other since there is so much abundance. Um, and if you store them well, they'll last you several years too. So maybe you don't need to save seeds every year of everything. Um, so that's another nice thing about seed keeping or seed saving. Um, you know, so related to this is it's getting harder to find certain varieties. We, over the last 50, 100 years, we've, we've lost so many of the varieties and so much of the diversity of our seeds uh, because of, you know, people moving away from the land, people um, buying only from the, the seed companies and, and hardware stores. And the seed companies and hardware stores only carry certain varieties. Like maybe you'll find 10 or 20 tomato varieties in a catalog or fewer in a hardware store. But once you start saving and swapping seeds, you know, there's thousands of varieties. And so that's, that's a way that seed keeping is able to help preserve some of these very difficult to find and rare um, or endangered is what I mean, varieties. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's also a practice of freedom. I think you were just really getting to that. So we always like to say um, that seed keeping is um, an act of true love for your, your ancestors and our collective future, and that it's a practice of, of freedom. So, you know, when we save our seeds, we don't have to go to the hardware store or the online catalog. We're, we're able to do this for free in our backyard, in our community garden, on our farm, um, and don't have to pay for anything. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's really it, it's really em, emboldening um, the autonomy the autonomy of it. Um, for me, I agree. It just feels so liberating. Um, just the more you learn, the more self sufficient or community sufficient um, we are and can become. Um, and like you're saying, just like insurance for the future. Like I remember one time, um, Akibalan visited us um, at our at our office, and we had all our all our shelves of our whole seed collection, which is our inventory. Um, which, when you see it in person, it's really impressive to just see so many jars of seeds. Um, Akibalan took one look around the room, and he was just like, "Dang, y'all are the bank." <laughs> and I was like, that's so true. Like we really like seed collections, seed keepers, and the seeds that are saved within community. That's the bank. Like that's really the insurance, the investment for ourselves and our community's future generations. Nice. Well, maybe on that note, hopefully people are, if weren't, they weren't already inspired, they are now <laughs> to save their own seeds. So let's get into the some of the considerations, right? We're like I said earlier, we're in this great position to talk about this early in the season. Maybe a bunch of you already planted your stuff, but it's early enough that a lot of our crops aren't in the ground yet. So this might help you with your crop plan to think through some of these, some of these different kind of ideas and and considerations. So yeah, and I wrote them all down. Oh my I saw rue, tomatoes, peppers, borage, okra, calendula, Japanese turnips, 
zinnias and other flowers, bok choy, collards, and pigeon peas. And then I noticed a couple more were added after our cultural crops kind of conversation. Um, so that's great. We, we can talk about a lot of these things as we go. Um, I guess before we jump into the, the chart that we're gonna put on the screen, I wanna say, just do it. Just save your seeds. Whatever we say today about the nuts and bolts, you can ignore it if you want. Just save your seeds. <laughs> so if you find what we're about to tell you to be too much information or too complicated, I don't, you know, I think we can all manage it. But if for any reason it, it seems overwhelming, just forget it. Just save the seeds. You're going to get something great. If it happens to have crossed with a neighbor's okra, it's still going to be a nice okra, right? If, it, if the turnip crosses with some other member of that spe species, it'll be still something edible. So um, even if you don't isolate your plants or don't have the option to isolate your plants because you're in a community garden or share space with other gardeners for some reason, you still can save your seeds, so. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't have to be perfect. Exactly. You'll learn, learn by doing. We learn by doing every year. Yes. And this is our job. <laughs> exactly. That said, there are some things you can do to have, you know, better reach your goals. So we're going to share those now. So, um, Mira, if you could show the seed keeping handout, not the spreadsheet, but the chart, that would be great. Um, and we're going to send you this handout and a, a PDF of our own handout that we made that's maybe less easier to understand because I just made it. Um, but it has more varieties that you mentioned in your chat. Um, we'll share them with everybody. Mira will share them, I believe, with everyone here afterwards. So we're going to go through a few things and they're mostly on this chart. So, you know, the first is thinking about um, is the crop an annual crop or a biennial crop? Uh, so annuals, as you may know, they live one year, they go to flower and fruit and make seed in that first year, right? And they die over the winter, especially in our climate. This is going to change depending on what part of the world you're in. But here, everything on this list is an annual. And then below this, there's a biennial list. Um, and so knowing your crop, uh, whether it's an annual or bi biennial can really help. I will say biennials is like when you're next level, when you're ready for the next level. You know, for some folks, some of these biennials just happen to go to seed anyway because we never pulled them out in the fall uh, and then we get an easy seed crop because it's still in the garden went to flower in the spring and went to seed in the late spring early summer um, and so some of these um, oh yeah I'll talk about seed life uh, some of these biennials are actually fairly easy for your average kind of gardener who doesn't clean their <laughs> clean up their garden in the fall winter because they'll just go ahead and go to seed um, but it's good to know that if you're trying to grow cabbage seed this year, it's not gonna happen, probably. It's gonna go to flower next year. So for us a lot, for example, with the cabbage family, we will plant a lot of our crops in the fall, get them to be a certain size, because in order for them to be triggered by the winter to go to flower, they need to be a certain size already, like a pencil thickness on the stem. So we'll plant cabbage family crops in the fall, let them size up a bit bigger than a pencil, and then they'll hopefully, you know, then go to seed, flower and seed the next year. So another thing to consider is, if we can go back up to the top, um, is learning by, you know, species names. My first, you know, 30 years as a human, I have, um, resisted learning this kind of Linnaean way of categorizing plants because it felt very strange to me. Um, one thing that's very helpful about it is it mostly, once you understand it, you, you mostly can determine whether your different plants will make babies together or not, whether they'll hybridize or not. Um, and so that's one really good reason to learn the species name, the genus and species name, or the binomial nomenclature, as it's called, of the crops that you're growing. Because then you can say, oh, you know, will my... Um, will my beet cross with anything else? And you'll find out that beets and Swiss chard are the same species, they're the same plant, 
And yes, they'll make a hybrid and you may not want a hybrid of chard and beets because then you'll get less leaf and less root. You know, um, it'll be a more leafy beet or a less leafy chard, you know what I mean? So learning about the species will really help with things that, you know, you want to avoid crossing. Or if you have your family heirloom bean from great grandpa or whatever, great grandma, and you realize, oh, that's the same species as this random other bean I'm growing, you may want to then think about how to keep them apart. Um, so that's where learning the species is very helpful. The species is the second name. Right. In the, the Latin, the botanical Latin name, the capitalized first word is the genus. The genus. genus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the um, second lowercase word is always going to be the species. Right. And a lot of gardeners and farmers learn the family, right? It's helpful to know that tomatoes and peppers and, you know, eggplants and tobacco are in the same family because they need similar things from the soil and they attract similar pests, you know, so it's helpful already as gardeners and farmers to know that much. So this is asking people to learn the rest of the kind of way we categorize those plants. And we categorize those plants by their ability, by their similarity in their sexual reproduction, right? So that's why it's particularly relevant to seed keeping. Um, basically, if it is the same species, that's because they can hybridize together. They can sexually reproduce together. And if they're not the same species, usually they can't. There's, the hard thing is it's a human-made system and humans are often wrong. And so there are examples of things that are different species that can still cross, which is usually things in the squash genus and the pepper genus in terms of common crops that we grow. Um, so we're more and more careful with our different pepper species to keep them separate, even though they're different species and sometimes with our squash, but it's less likely with squash. Um, so a lot of people will say, oh, I'm growing a bean, like a common bean and I'm growing a black eyed pea, are they gonna cross? They're so unrelated that there's no way that they're gonna cross. They're both legumes, they're both called beans a lot of times, but once you learn the species, you'll see, oh, they're really distant cousins. There's just not a chance that they're gonna cross pollinate and hybridize. So there, this is a helpful um, thing for you to look at on your seed packet. Usually it'll say the genus and species. Um, and if not, you can usually Google it or look at the seed company online and learn about that. So yeah, species. Uh, then the next column is pollination. So how does this plant, you know, move pollen? How does the pollen get moved on this plant from one flower to the next, from one individual usually to another individual plant? And this column gives you a sense that, for example, arugula and everything in the cabbage family requires the help of bees and flies and so on to move that pollen between individuals. And for things like the beans, where it says self-pollinated, they don't need anybody's help. They have it covered. They can, within one flower, pollinate themselves and make the bean that way. Um, they don't need the bees. That doesn't mean bees don't move pollen, because they do sometimes, but they don't need them to. Um, so with the cabbage family, they require it. There's no way they're going to pollinate themselves. They require the help of insects. With the legume family and the, you know, a lot of the um, asters, for example, like lettuce, they really don't need pollinators' help. But they do use pollinators' help to improve the genetic diversity of their species. Um, so there's still the chance for cross pollination, even though they don't need it. So I don't know if I'm getting too in the weeds about this, but I wanted to share, share a little bit about how plant biology works and, and have it help us think through why we might need to keep things separate. Yeah. And I saw a question about, um, let's see, they usually cross if they share a species. Right, yes, they usually do cross if they share a species and if they're within range of whatever's pollinating them, whether it's the wind or the insect, or, you know, if that's why we have the next column, which is isolation distance to keep for us to keep our different varieties of the same species isolated from each other. So that's a good question. But that's, yes, that's the core, that's the crux of it. Yes, they will cross if they're the same species. That's why they were 
categorized that way um, to let us know that they will make babies together because they're both from the same species. Um, so yeah, and then isolation distance. This I usually like to do in a, you know, before the pandemic in a group of people where people come and volunteer to be different varieties of different species within one genus and have people use this chart to say, okay, you move 10 feet that way, you move a half mile that way. Um, we can't do that in this, in this environment. Um, but just imagine that each of us is a different type of being, okay? I don't know how many of us are in here. Um, think of your favorite legume, okay? I know some people already said pigeon peas. Um, maybe you can write in the chat your favorite legume in the bean family and variety if it's a type, if it's a specific type. So go, go, go for it. We're, we're counting on you to give us our give us our prompts for the next lesson. <laughs> What's your favorite bean variety or legume in general? We already got pigeon peas from somewhere. Okay, pinto beans, that's a Phaseolus vulgaris species. Fava is a whole other genus. Um, let's see what else comes through. Peanut is a whole other genus, distant relatives of all the other ones so far. Peas, so that's like a garden pea or something's called an English pea, even though it's Middle Eastern. Um, so that's a different genus too. Black eyed peas, different. okay, we have a really, we could all grow our favorites in the same garden, except for the cannellini. The cannellini and the pinto will cross pollinate because they're the same genus and species. And the snow peas will cross with the split, the split peas because they're the same genus and species also. So we mostly are good. And luckily with the legume family, you'll see they're, they're self-pollinated and their isolation distances. If you look here, try to find the isolation distance for beans and fava beans. They're just 20 feet and 50 feet respectively. So hypothetically, we could grow the pinto and the cannellini, but you know, 20 feet apart from each other. The yard long bean is the same species as the black eyed pea. It was brought across Asia, you know, I don't know, thousands, maybe thousands of years ago and selected for the young, eating the young pod and it was selected for being very long, but it's the same original species as black eyed peas from Africa. So those are ones that we would need to isolate. Um, and of course, this, this chart is, is not, is somewhat um, basic. It doesn't have a lot of our culturally important crops on it. Um, so that's where you could look at the one that we're gonna send you as a spreadsheet because we'll have black eyed peas on there and okra, for example. So that's an example, like if we were one community garden and that was our list, we could probably work it out and grow all those things as long as the cannellini and the um, pinto beans were at least 20 feet apart and the yard long bean and the black eyed peas were, I think it's more like 100 feet. Um, so maybe across the entire garden from each other. Um, but honestly, if you grew them entwined with each other, there would be very little crossing. It's just a chance that they would cross. So with legumes, we're pretty good in a community setting. If we look at the squash family, it's much more challenging. Um, even on one farm, we might only be able to grow one of each species. Um, and so it depends on which crop we're talking about because those ones need a half mile of isolation. Or corn. or corn, which could need up to two or three miles depending on what our, our um, you know, humidity levels are like because it goes on the wind and the humidity could help it fall quicker. Our topography, corn, corn uh, pollen won't go over, uh, you know, huge barriers. Um, and if it's insect pollinated, um, you know, you can create barriers like grow that row of flowers between your two crops that you want to make sure the bees kind of stop over, you know, get the other kind of pollen on them, you know, hopefully have some sort of interruption in their path so that they can, there's less of a chance that your pollen will go from one species, you know, the same species to the one variety of a species to another variety of the same species. Some people with corn will plant a huge plot of it and only harvest from the furthest side of the corn. You know, the idea is that pollen from a different field will land in the first few rows of the corn first. Uh, I've heard that many times. I've never tried it. 
Another thing with corn is you can plant one crop of corn and then plant your second crop like four weeks later so that they're tasseling at different times and the pollen will not be able to cross pollinate because the, the sexual reproductive period of the first corn is finished by the time the second corn is, is tasseling or flowering. So there's ways, ways around it. Yeah, so these are the basic ideas. The last one I wanna talk, I guess I'll mention the other two columns. Number of plants is really just, we're thinking about inbreeding really and, and genetic diversity. Um, if you have just a few plants of something like corn that is fully dependent on other individuals for its health, unlike beans that are self-pollinating, you're gonna have not great quality seed if you have one or two corn plants. And a lot of people say to grow at least 50 or 100 or 200 corn plants so that the strength of the um, population is really high. And then there's plants like the bean where you can grow 10 and still have really strong genetic diversity. Um, so that's something to consider when you're, you know, saving your seed. Though I read in a book that this is really something for, you know, the experts to focus on. If you're just saving your family variety, that's important in itself. And if you have only one seed of that corn, that's important in itself. And in future years, either you or someone else can take that on and increase the genetic diversity. And there's a bunch of ways to do that. The most basic way is just grow a lot of it. Um, and there's other ways to collaborate with other people that also have that variety that will help increase the genetic diversity. And then the final you know, numerical column is seed life. And that's just how long saved seeds will last um, if they're stored properly, which is in a dark, dry place with you know, no access for insects and other critters to get to them, like a screw top lid um, and somewhat cool temperature. So, that's your little tour of this helpful sheet. Um, I hope it can be a good resource for you. Another one for me has been Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth. It's a great book that I really leaned heavily on when I first started mentoring under my Seed to Seed Saving Mentor. Um, it was a great reference for a lot of what I was learning because um, she includes so many species in there of plants um, that humans use beyond what this chart or even the one that we'll send from our own spreadsheet can tell you. So Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth is a really valuable resource. This is our chart that um, Mara just showed for a second. And we wanted to share that with you as well. It's a modified version of what, um, what we are giving to our farmers with fewer columns. Um, oh yeah, we can, if we can show the biennial page real quick. And this will be sent to you. Um, so yeah, you'll see none of them are sulfurs. They're all insect or wind pollinated. Um, and a lot of them are the same species like kale, kohlrabi, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, broccoli. Um, you know, so that's something to watch out for. You're gonna get some interesting mix if you're saving, you know, cabbage and cauliflower and broccoli and Brussels sprouts in the same garden. Um, there'll definitely be a funny, a funny hybrid happening. So yeah, um, I, I, I realized that we're three quarters of the way through and we haven't addressed most of your plants that you wanted us to talk about. I'm wondering if you wanted to, if I missed anything that you noticed or if you wanted to take a stab at any of this. From the chart? Mm -hmm. I feel like the chart lays it out pretty clearly. And I think the list, y'all's list is, is good to talk about because we can start to talk about how to recognize when your seeds are going to be ready for harvest, like when they're gonna be mature or what um, time of the plant's life cycle is good to be getting ready um, to harvest them. So I feel like the, the list of y'all's plant varieties makes sense. Off the top of my head, something like tomatoes, I've learned from working at True Love um, that it's really good to save from the earliest fruits, mm -hmm. right? Which is not something I, it just never even crossed my mind before I was like, oh, well there's seeds in every tomato, so it doesn't matter which, which tomato I seed, save seed from, which 
it's true, you can save seed from any of them, but if you um, want to have the earliest starting, the earliest fruiting tomatoes and be selecting for them to continue to put on early fruit that you want, um, you save, you know, the perfectly ripe, mature, beautiful tomato at the exact one that you want to eat, the best one, mm -hmm. all the best ones that come first. Um, you know, if you cut them open and the seeds look nice and plump and the right color, light brown, <laughs> good tomato seed color, um, then those are the, the perfect seeds to start with because you're, as, as always with seed stuff, you're like thinking farther into the future um, when you're selecting them. Yeah, other seeds, let's see. The other reason with the tomato to collect the first fruit, besides the fact that now we're basically plant breeders, right? When you're saving seed, you're selecting what the future generations will look like by what you decide to take or not take seeds from. So I really like that you said the best fruits. A lot of people are like, oh, that one's ugly. I'll just use that one for seed saving. And then you're selecting ugly, an ugly fruited plant for the future. <laughs> so you want to really think about the most beautiful, most delicious you know, earliest tomato for those reasons, but also because tomatoes get diseases in the end of the season, right? So it's helpful to always save from the healthiest plants for that reason. So you're not maybe accidentally bringing a disease on the seed to the next generation. Um, you know, so that's another great reason to do early. Early tomatoes. Same with okra. Mm. People often who I'm working with around okra, they're like, oh yeah, we'll save okra at the end of the year, but then okra is, pods actually take a while to mature and people often miss the window of harvest because they wait until the end of the year and then the frost comes before the seeds are fully uh, viable which is when the fruit is crackly and dry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah I see a question in the chat that says at which point in the life of the plant or the fruiting do you collect the seed um, and that's a great question because it's literally different for every plant. Um, obviously, you know, categories of plants will be similar, um, like tomatoes and peppers um, and things. So for some plants, like the ones we're talking about, tomatoes, peppers, um, you harvest the seed from the same exact time of the season that you're harvesting the fruit um, and peppers that you would want to eat. Um, but other, other plants, they take much longer in the season, or it's just a, a later part of the life cycle of the plant um, that they'll show the seed to you. Um, like something on the list is calendula. Um, in my experience, calendula will go to flower, you know, um, in early summer and continue, in our climate will continue flowering, especially we harvest the flowers uh, for medicine. Um, and the more you harvest calendula flowers, the more flowers will bloom. Um, so it'll continue, har it'll continue flowering uh, through the early fall here, I would think. Um, but it'll, after the flower, happens if you just leave the, the flower head there and you don't um, grab more flowers or deadhead them, then over time, it'll just sort of morph into these really cool brown, I always say they look like, like a witch's finger, uh, little seeds that are going to be healthy brown looking, kind of spiky and Something that I'm learning as a general idea is when the seeds of something are mature and ready, they often come off very, they want to come off because mm -hmm. they're mature, they're ready. If, if the human wasn't there, they want to come off because they're ready to go in the soil. They're ready to plant themselves, which is what they do when we're not there. Um, so for something like calendula, once it makes this like cool, spiky, brown seed heads, if you just kind of gently put your hands on it, the seeds will come away and they'll just come easily right into your hand. And that is 
kind of a sign of maturity I've seen from, from several types of plants. Um, peppers are on y'all's list as well. Similar to tomatoes, you harvest pepper seeds from the, the best, ripest, most deliciousest fruits. Mm -hmm. um, and so you want them to be totally mature. That means the full mature color of whatever pepper variety you're growing. And that also means when you go to pluck the pepper, um, if you're pulling that hard and it's not coming off, it's not ready to come off. Don't <laughs> take it for seed because it's too early. Yeah, and the pepper, people often eat green and purple peppers, which are just not fully ripe. So we may think of them as ripe for eating, but green, green and purple peppers will, will not yield high quality or ripe seeds. They might, might be able to grow something from them, but they're really not done incubating the next generation. So they need to turn yellow or red or orange for them to be fully ripe for peppers. So that's the thing is like really getting to know these plants in a deeper way than we did before. Like we want to know their entire cycle from seed to seed. And sometimes that means meeting like these elder plants that we wouldn't have known before, you know, mm -hmm. like, like the red pepper instead of the green bell pepper or like the three foot tall lettuce with dandelion poofs on it instead of the, you know, short little um, lettuce on the ground that we're cutting for our salads. Um, so we're getting to meet these like beautiful, you know, elders in the end of their life cycle for a lot of, for a lot of these cases. Um, I mean, relatedly, uh, oh, and relatedly, someone's asking about um, cucumbers. Like if you let them ripen in order to save the seed, then the plant won't produce as much for the rest of the season. Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds true. You know, it's funny because everything we grow is only for seed pretty much. Um, but in, in cases like that, you might want to, section off like 10 feet of your row. I don't know, you know, how much cucumbers you're growing. Um, but if you have the ability to save certain plants for seed, hopefully it's the healthiest looking plants. Um, and, and then other ones that you're harvesting regularly for food, that's, that's one way to do it. That's the way a lot of the market farmers we work with do it. If they're growing okra for our catalog, for example, they'll like save maybe 20 feet of their okra patch and then the other 100 feet will be for sale for at the market. Um, but they'll have to like rope it off saying, do not harvest, this is for seed saving only. Um, so identifying which are the healthiest plants and then marking, making sure you don't harvest from them for your market or for your kitchen um, so that you're keep making sure you have that security of having a seed crop for the next few years. So that's one way to, and cucumbers, as you probably know, they need to get big and ugly and giant and, and you know, they turn like yellow or orange or some color like yeah. that um, before they're truly ripe for seeds. We can't plant those little flimsy seeds that come in the cucumbers yeah. that we eat. Like way past when we would eat it. Mm -hmm. And that's true for summer squash. It's true for a lot of um, crops that where we eat immature fruits. Um, you know, we want the fruits to be fully mature when we take the seeds. And with winter squash, it's nice because it's like tomatoes and, and peppers where you can eat it at the same time as you're taking the seeds out. But for many of these, you sacrifice that ability to eat the, the vegetable um, or fruit in order to get the seeds. Mm -hmm. It just means like, it's part of why we plan to plant enough, mm -hmm. plant enough of that variety so you can do both if you're, if you're able. Right, yeah. So this time of year, you can put in a few extra if you want and they'll still benefit from the genetic diversity of the rest of the row that's being harvested for food because um, the bees or the wind will be moving that pollen around. Um, but so they'll get the genetic diversity even if you're only saving from a few plants and there's other plants in the row there for food. So I was asking if eggplant is in the same boat and also mm, potatoes. Yeah, eggplant is like cucumbers in that you don't, we eat them immature usually. So you wanna wait till they get big and ugly. Sometimes they turn brown or yellow or something like that before their seeds are fully ripe. And you can get a sense of it if you harvest your first fruit and you cut it open and you see, oh, these seeds are flimsy and white or clear. You know, that's not gonna be a ripe, a ripe seed. Mm -hmm. Seeds should be hard and durable. Um, and so that's, you know, a lot of times we grow new species to us and we don't have a mentor to tell us when exactly to take the seed. But at this point, we recognize that seeds are, when they're ripe, are durable and hard usually. Um, and depending on the family, we get a sense of what color they should be, though it changes species to species. Mm -hmm. so. And I feel like you'll really get a feel for, for what looks 
immature seed or what looks mature, um, just already going into the season cognizant that you are looking for the seed and paying attention for the seed. So for things that you're eating the harvest before the seed will be mature, look at how the seed looks in the, in the fruit. Um, and what's an example? Something that the seed would be like, I guess cucumber, like you already said, flat, white, like deflated kind Fancy. of. Yeah, it's not, you, you already know from looking at that, that you wouldn't plant that. Right. And you, you can, you'll be able to get a feel just as you continue for what really looks more mature and try it out. I wonder if we could do a quick, a, qu a quick rapid fire on some of these things that they, that they mentioned. Um, potatoes and asparagus, people don't often think of them as sexually reproducing since we plant asparagus crowns and potato tubers, but they do sexually reproduce. And with the asparagus, you can find the red berries. Um, usually you buy, I can't remember, I think it's, I forget which one is desired, if it's the male or female. It's unusual in that asparagus is, you know, male or female plants. Most of our, these plants are not, they're both. Um, so then you'll get seeds, but then you're gonna get a whole mix of um, sexes, I guess, of asparagus, which I think is cool because then you're, you know, you have a more, you have a more um, dynamic kind of ecosystem of asparagus with their pollinators and so on. And you can get more seed in the future. Um, with potatoes, it's hard to find the little potato berries, but they look like little green tomatoes almost, and they'll drop pretty quickly. Um, and you'll be hard to find them. So you, you um, oh yeah, plants are very, a lot of our plants are non-binary. They're, they're both and neither, um, most of these. Um, but to the potato berries, you'll want them to be a little soft and wrinkly, but really watch them carefully because they drop and disappear um, quickly. The um, rue is another example of one that we don't often think of as flowering and going to seed, um, unless we really know the plant. It has beautiful flowers and then these, these hard, black seeds form uh, where the flowers were. Um, and that's when you harvest them, when the stem of the rue flower turns brown. And that's true for a lot of these dry seeded crops like zinnias and like the bok choy, um, Japanese turnips, collards, you know, the cabbage family will create those beautiful, you know, yellow flowering usually or white flowering um, seed heads or flowers and then they'll turn to seed and they'll have all these little fruits all over it. Um, and once those start to yellow and then turn brown, that's when you hear the rattle of the seed, that's when you harvest the seed of the cabbage family crops. You wanna hear a little crunch and a little rattle. And the birds are gonna be watching it too. So this is another crop planting moment where you think, how am I gonna protect my seed harvest from the birds? And so you might wanna get some netting or decide that you let the birds have what they want and you'll get what's left over. Um, so, Again, okra, you wait for it to get crunchy, crispy. It's true for the whole legume family, like the pigeon peas. You want them to be black and crispy. Um, a lot of the like peas and beans will turn tan or brown and crispy. Um, and so that's um, borage I've had trouble with because the seeds drop easily too before I get to them. So I'm still learning on borage, but you just want to always watch that flower as it turns to seed as they ripen and, and get a sense of when they're starting to drop those seeds so you can try to gather them before they disappear. Uh, luckily it self seeds so easily, you'll have it there again all the time anyway. Um, but if you wanna share the seeds, you just gotta watch closely and act quickly. <laughs> so I think, that's, I think that's a little bit on all the varieties you mentioned. We have one final question and then we're gonna close out the webinar. And I wanna thank you both so much for sharing your incredible knowledge today in such a beautiful hour. Spending that with you has been really great. So thank you. Um, do, do plants that self-pollinate also benefit from insect pollination creating bigger fruit or do insects have no effect? Uh, do they create bigger fruit? I have not heard of that. However, maybe indirectly, uh, insects with self-pollinating plants, like I said earlier, they really help increase the genetic diversity of the population in that the self-pollinated plants are fine to, to just pollinate themselves. Um, but if they get pollen from the neighbors, they're gonna be, they're gonna have more gene mixing, um, less inbreeding, and potentially more resistance to diseases 
and potentially bigger fruit, you'll get more variance. You know, the more that there's sexual reproduction, the more variance you're gonna get in the population. And that's often a good thing for the ability to select further traits in the future as a human or as the environment changes, you know, there'll be natural selection and some will make it and some won't. And so the more genetic variability you have in the population, the better, which is really why what we're doing is very strange, right? The plants actually want to hybridize with each other. So keeping variety separate um, is, the, is central to our work because yeah. we want that heirloom, you know, very important variety. But for the plant's perspective, the more gene mixing, hybridizing, sexual reproduction between different populations, you know, the better for the plant's health. So you can try to mimic that within one variety as much as you can by having many plants, by encouraging insect pollination, by swapping seeds with someone else who has the same variety as you just to mix those populations, et cetera. Awesome, thank you so much, Julia. Thank you so much, Owen. Um, excited to see everyone again for parts two and three of this series coming up in May and June, I think. Thank you all so much, everyone, for coming and sharing all your knowledge and um, expertise and preferences and seed ideas in the chat. It was really great having everyone here. Um, and we hope you have a really great afternoon.